Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, DAB and online. Today we'll be discussing whether or not Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are competing to actually lose the next general election. And we'll get stuck into our critical race theory that's going through our schools, that radical activism. And before 4pm, we'll talk about the farmers in the Netherlands. Dutch farmers took to the highways in a protest against government moves to reduce nitrogen emissions. Will we see something like that happening here in Britain with our net zero obsession? But first, here's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past two. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. Queues to the port of Dover have been reduced down to around an hour after two days of severe delays for travellers and lorry drivers. Officials at the port say they've worked around the clock to clear both freight and tourist traffic in Dover. British authorities say they've received strong support from their French border colleagues to clear the backlog of more than 200 miles worth of traffic. However, in Folkestone, travellers hoping to use the Eurotunnel have been warned to still expect long delays, with reports estimating those to be around 90 minutes. Additional checks on the border post-Brexit and understaffing of French officials had been blamed for the delays, which saw some 18 hours for some travellers. But travel editor at The Independent, Simon Calder, says the reality of the situation is different. Well, some of the ideas that this is all the French and they could just wave us through, that is absolutely not the case. Um, and it's quite interesting that, um, well, the government will be delighted with this headline from the front page of the Sunday Times, a French insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos. British insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos is actually the reality. The Board of Cricket Scotland has resigned ahead of the publication of an independent review into racism. The review has been conducted after Scotland's all-time leading wicket-taker, Majid Hack, told Sky Sports News that Cricket Scotland was institutionally racist. In a letter, the board apologised and said the review would provide a watershed moment for Scottish sport. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have vowed to toughen controls on migration as part of their bids to become next Tory leader and Prime Minister. Mr Sunak said he would tighten the definition of who qualifies for asylum and introduce a cap on refugee numbers. Liz Truss said she would extend the UK's Rwanda asylum plan and increase the number of Border Force staff. More than 14,000 migrants have crossed the Channel on small boats so far this year. Well, the public is split on who would make a better prime minister. An opinion survey of 2,000 adults found that 43% back the former chancellor, compared to 36% for the foreign secretary. This is in contrast to Conservative Party members, where a YouGov poll has placed Liz Truss 24 points ahead of Rishi Sunak. 
Well, earlier, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Therese Coffey, outlined why she is backing Liz Truss to become Prime Minister. Liz a long time and uh, she's one of my closest friends in politics and it's not just for that reason, far from it. It's because I know that she has delivered and she's been in the Cabinet since 2014. She's uh, served in five different roles and was an Education Minister before there. And whatever you can do, say about Liz, she absolutely delivers. Meanwhile, Conservative MP Richard Holden outlined why he is supporting Rishi Sunak. She was back Brexit all the way through. Uh, he's not a late convert. He was uh, putting himself under real strain as a brand new MP in 2016 to really go and back it. Secondly, I think he's got a proper plan for the economy. Deal with inflation first, then move on to tax cuts. Uh, and I think that's a sensible way to go. It's a sort of way Mrs Thatcher would have gone about it. Wildfires in Greece have destroyed homes on the island of Lesbos. Authorities have evacuated the popular tourist resort of Vatera as firefighters tackle the flames. The fires started in the island's mountains before spreading rapidly due to strong winds. This comes as wildfires in other parts of the country over the past week have forced hundreds of people to flee. Kate Moss said she had to run away from a photo shoot after a man asked her to go topless when she was 15. In a rare, wide-ranging interview with BBC Radio 4 programme Desert Island Discs, the supermodel touched on numerous issues, such as her support for actor Johnny Depp during his recent libel trial. She also said she felt scapegoated by the media due to her drug use in the 1990s. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens, of course. Now, though, it's back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Yes, what's coming up on the show? Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak continue their battle to be the next Prime Minister. Rod Little, associate editor at The Spectator, says the Tories have written their own death certificate by rushing the leadership race We'll be asking him why that is. The government has given the go-ahead for the new Sizewell C nuclear power plant on the Suffolk coast. But what might be seen as good for jobs and lower energy bills by some isn't seen the same way by people living in the area. But is this nimbyism or do they have a point? We'll discuss. And should sports stars who travel the world be forced to take the COVID vaccination or face being banned from competitions. Surely it's about personal choice. But is it fair that the tennis star Novak Djokovic, who hasn't had the jab, is allowed to compete against fellow athletes who have had it? I'll be giving you my take. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As always, though, your thoughts are much more important than my own. Was it right to get rid of Boris, despite his gaffes and, you know, one or two untruths, it has to be said? Will they live to regret it? Rod Little seems to think so, but you can tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook, crack and content on our page. Cheers very much. Now, to start off the show, I want to read this tweet to you from Stonewall, the LGBT plus whatever the alphabet soup is these days charity. They posted an article from the Metro newspaper and said, research suggests that children as young as two recognize their trans identity. Yet, many nurseries and schools teach a binary understanding of pre-assigned gender. Now, this is a charity that's been living the high life at the expense of the taxpayer and big businesses through its Stonewall diversity scheme in which HR departments scramble over each other to fight among public bodies, finance giants and others for a spot on its coveted diversity champion leaderboard. It allows these businesses, you see, to boast of their diversity and inclusivity. When the BBC quit the scheme, the charity warned that it would harm their LGBTQ staff, as if being part of an outfit that's pushing extreme narratives, like the suggestion, of course, that a child as young as two ought to be learning about its gender identity before reading and writing. Most recently, Lord Callanan, a Conservative peer and minister, and Geordie, it has to be said, so good for him, he's in the business department, and he announced via Twitter that the entire department, business department, a big department, was now a stonewall 
free zone. And if you ask me, others absolutely have to follow suit. There can be absolutely no excuse, no reasonable justification, no proportionality that says that the taxpayer ought to fund this activist outfit. We need to let kids be kids. Kids can self-identify as whatever they want, actually. Which child hasn't self-identified as Buzz Lightyear, Harry Potter, or maybe Obi-Wan Kenobi? But precious few, I dare say, can actually understand issues around sex and gender, and nor should they. Fewer still are able to comprehend what generally irreversible hormone and puberty treatments could actually do to their bodies. But you see, it suits Stonewall to find new fights to fight, even if it involves the introduction of toddlers to its activism. And Stonewall say, as children and young people grow up, it's crucial that they can be themselves without feeling that there's anything wrong about doing so. LGBTQ plus inclusive education simply means ensuring children grow up understanding that LGBTQ plus people exist and that we are valid. It means learning that some families have two mums or two dads and that some people are trans and non-binary. Now, most of those who've criticised this charity have been accused of transphobia or of a bigoted attempt to smear and disparage a charity. This, of course, is nonsense. The charity's foray into nurseries and schools will discredit them perfectly well, thank you very much, without any woman legitimately concerned about access to single-sex spaces ever could. And, folks, it has to be said. As Equalities Minister Liz Truss said public bodies should leave the scheme, she was brave and bold at that time in refusing to bow down to a very vocal minority on Twitter. So I say here's to more public bodies protecting the public purse from this gender ideology and letting kids be kids by saying no to this group and its schemes. <laughs>uh, either for MPs or indeed for the public or for Conservative Party members to find out what each of the candidates actually stand for. And that was made very plain by the uh, by the gradual dawning. And, it, you know, we should have had weeks to discuss this, that Penny Morden was woker than a snowy owl at three o'clock in the morning um, and, and obviously not suited to run a party called the Conservative Party. Uh, similarly, it didn't give enough time for Kenny Badenoch or Badenoch however you wish to pronounce it, uh, to push her case uh, uh, and, and to get her views across in a way which would have, I think, shown the party that she could have been a very, very good leader indeed. She was the only one, perhaps along with Tom Tugendhat, who looked to take the party forward and who I think could have had an effect uh, on, the, uh, on the voting public. Uh, and certainly, you know, uh, from the story which you were talking about before on LGBTQI and Stonewall, uh, she would have been bang on the money with that. Mm -hmm. The other problem <laughs> is that we now have Liz Truss and um, Rishi. And what will happen, almost certainly, is that Rishi Sunak, I think, would have stood a much better chance of winning a general election, but he won't get a chance to do so because Liz Truss will win amongst Conservative Party members who want someone from the right of the party, uh, whereas Rishi is probably more seen as being in the centre and possibly even liberal. So I think Rishi, Rishi would have stood a better chance of winning the election, but even then he wouldn't have won the election because there were so many people 
conservative voters and people who are particularly fond of the Conservative Party who voted Tory in 2019 for Boris Johnson uh, and uh, are furious at the way in which Boris Johnson was treated. And now I have to say, I think Boris should have gone uh, because of the way he mishandled a whole bunch of events. But nonetheless, there are a number of people, a large number of people who voted Tory, not because they like the Tories, but because they like Boris Johnson. So I, so I, I think neither of the candidates has quite what it takes to win the next election. And I think uh, uh, that's probably bad news for the country, even though I'm not a Tory myself. Yeah, Sophie, do you agree with that, that Boris Johnson you know, made fundamental mistakes there and that he ought to have gone, but actually places not too far away from where you are in Durham might think twice about voting for the Conservatives without Boris Johnson? Oh, I, d I don't even think you can say might. I think it's pretty much guaranteed that they are now probably going to lose almost all of the Red Wall seats. And I actually think seats like mine, where UKIP have previously performed pretty well and where I'm assuming that reform are going to stand, also could be on the chopping block. Because back when there was another right-wing party, the Conservatives were only winning by 92 votes. So th there's, there's a lot of ground to make up here. And the problem is, is that what's come of this is that the, the membership are angry that they've got rid of Boris in the first place, but now they are even more angry at the fact that we've been left with uh, Liz and Rishi because they wanted Kemi and Penny. So I think there's a real disconnect between what the membership, the grassroots, the most important fundamental part of the Conservative Party want and the MPs that, that are representing it. So there's a massive amount of infighting going on within the party. We've got one separate battle between Liz and Rishi, and we've got another battle between the membership of the Conservative Party and the MPs themselves. Mm. Dominique, do you actually think the Conservative Party are going to, in the not-too-distant future, perhaps some conversations are even going on right now, where they're saying, oh, dear, we have made a pretty monumental mistake here, and that the next leader, whoever it might be, is basically just a caretaker to take them into opposition. I think the sort of thinking behind it was that if it was either Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, they, either of them two would have more of a mandate to govern um, as opposed to someone who hadn't previously been in Cabinet before. And I think one of the reasons why um, Liz Truss um, is so favoured and why she will probably win um, is because she remained in the cabinet and remained largely loyal to Boris Johnson and actually didn't, she wasn't one of the ones that came out and called for him to resign. And I think the logic is people specifically voted for Boris Johnson and Liz Truss is one of the people that largely wants to continue on his legacy, is echoing a lot of the things that he's called for before, such as tax cuts, which Rishi Sunak has been emphatically against. He wants to focus more on inflation, which is why I think the logic is that Liz Truss would be the best option. But the problem with that is, is that Liz Truss doesn't seem to really have any charisma or any real ability to be able to connect with the same people that Boris Johnson was able to connect with. And this is the difficulty with getting rid and overlooking um, someone like Kemi Babynop, an actual Conservative with Conservative values um, that actually wanted to take the Conservative Party forward. Rather, we've got two quite toxic characters who were involved um, in the Cabinet whilst Boris Johnson was, quite frankly, being disgraced and he was sort of thrown out in a really unscrupulous way. You've got two people that sort of represent that toxicity. And I think that's the real mistake. And essentially, as recent polls do show, um, if there was a general election called, Labour would only just win a majority. Even though that's only just, that's a majority all the same, and, and that's not good for the Conservatives at all. Yeah, because, Rod, coming back to you, we've got basically ended up with Robo, Rishi and Lifeless Liz. And I'm wondering <laughs> to, to what extent, actually... And I feel quite angry about this, and I'm, I know I'm going to annoy quite a few of my viewers when I say this, but I'm actually quite angry at Boris Johnson, Rod, and hear me out. I'm angry that he, he was given... The, the, basically, he, the votes he secured in 2019 were lent to him, right? And it was for yeah. this promise. The red wall seats were promised all of these, basically that they would be no longer forgotten communities of Britain, right? Regional Britain would be heard. It would have its voice heard. And there was real hope and optimism behind that, those votes in 2019. And I just feel that the most golden opportunity has been utterly squandered. 
yes, it's a terrible waste. And the, the, the truth is that many of the things which people liked in Boris Johnson were, of course, his undoing in the end, in that he is rather cavalier. Uh, he doesn't take things seriously. Um, and that's, that was rather attractive to the public. You know, this is a guy who doesn't come from the usual political mould. Uh, and uh, and indeed, once he was in office, he didn't act like a politician. He didn't master briefs. He didn't know detail. And he was too inclined to not tell the truth when, when uh, in, in a kind of reflexive manner. Uh, so I, I think that is a huge problem and a huge waste of that 80 seat majority. But up here, you know, in, in County Durham, uh, it wasn't just a vote for Boris Johnson. It was also a vote a very fervid vote against Jeremy Corbyn and the kind of identitarian politics which the Labour Party was at that time uh, pursuing. Um, so, so there's that to take into account as well, because over the last couple of years, the Conservative Party really hasn't done very much to push back against the kind of idiocies which you outlined in that story uh, about um, Stonewall. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it hasn't gone anywhere near enough to do that. If it did, that is a vote winner. Uh, and I would say, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name to, to, to the lady who spoke first. Don't worry about reform standing. It will be the Social Democratic Party, which is standing up there. Uh, we'll, we'll be standing throughout the area. Uh, and I assure you, we will do pretty well, having just won a seat in Leeds. Uh, uh, so it will be a party which has those socially conservative values. Values, yeah, yeah. Will... And looks more, in, basically on the economy, a little bit more interventionist. But Sophie... You've heard what we've had to say about Boris. I just want to really quickly let you come in as someone who is still emphatically pro-Boris. Mm. Sophie. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I think getting rid of the Prime Minister is going to be one of the greatest acts of self-harm that this country has done. And it is one of the great acts of self-harm that the Conservative Party have done. And a large part of the, the membership have called for, obviously, for him to be reinstated onto a separate ballot, must I add, not on the same one, um, for the membership to decide whether Boris should stay or, or should he go. Because, as I said before, a, a lot of them wish that he would stay. Yeah, OK, we'll have to leave it there, Thorks, but thank you very much for your thoughts. That was the assistant editor of The Spectator, Rod Little, political commentators, Dominique Samuels, and Sophie Kokorin there. Thank you very much for your time. Joining me in the studio is the Head of Regulatory Affairs at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Victoria Hewson. Victoria, I want to actually ask you, before you give me your take on what you've just heard there from Rod Little, Sophie and, and Dominique, that Simon Calder story there that we've been running in the bulletins, where people are saying, look, this is exactly what you Brexiteers wanted. This is a product of Brexit, the travel chaos at Dover. Is that correct? It's not strictly correct, no. It's a, it's a bit of a mixed picture. So the UK, even when we were in the EU, we weren't part of the Schengen borderless movement of people's zone. So we always had passport checks that would happen when we were going to France or any other EU country. Now, what happened is that those checks are now a bit more um, precise, the passport officers will have to do a little bit more checking and they want to put a little stamp in the passport. And so there, there has been a, a bit of an increase in the time taken to do that. But as I understand it, in the current instance, the problem has been that the French authorities simply did not put the requisite number of officers on the gates. Um, I think the Port of Dover said that there are 12 gates and only six of them were manned. Mm. So obviously the, the dynamics of queuing means that that has an exponential effect all the way back uh, through, the, through the port. So it's a, it's a logistical uh, breakdown, but I don't think it's got too much to do with Brexit, to be honest. Because I'm quite sick, to be quite honest with you, of every single thing that could possibly go wrong being blamed on Brexit. You know, everything is Brexit's fault. These people are absolutely mad to, to find something, a stick with which to clobber the Brexiteers with and don't want to move on from that argument. Well, I think they've got a very rosy idea of what it's ever been like trying to get away well, indeed, uh, yes, on the first yes, week of the school yes, holidays. I, re I remember seamless. sitting in a car in the in the ferry queue to well, try to get I, to France. Well, I bet you a fair few of my viewers do too. But Victoria Houston, thank you very much. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Are our schools under pressure to be woke? 
That's what the right leaning spike claim. They are saying too many schools are teaching children divisive ideas about race. We'll be discussing the teaching of critical race <clears> theory <throat> in our schools with Professor Eric Kaufman. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking very wet and thundery in the northwest, warm sunshine in the southeast. Let's take a look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it will be often cloudy with some rain at times, as well as blustery winds. The rain shouldn't be particularly heavy though. Meanwhile, in the southeast, and after a hot day, it will stay fine and very warm through the evening, with some further sunshine for most. A cloudier picture across Wales. Here there will be some blustery winds, especially around the coasts and over the mountains, with some spells of rain. It will also be largely cloudy around Birmingham and in the West Midlands, whilst it will be drier and less windy than further west. A few spots of rain are possible this evening. It's looking similar around northeast England, where there'll be quite a bit of cloud this evening and some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times, with blustery winds too. A wet end to the day across Scotland with heavy and thundery spells of rain. A warning has been issued for southwestern Scotland where impacts are likely from the rain. There'll also be some impacts from the rain for Northern Ireland, although the worst of this should have cleared here by this evening, albeit with some showers following. A little rain spreads across the UK overnight, whilst in Scotland the rain will continue to be heavy and thundery at times. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Welcome back. Now, the campaign group Don't Divide Us says that it's discovered that more than 20% of local councils in England and Wales encourage the teaching of, wait for it, anti-racism models like critical race theory in schools. The figures were obtained by a freedom of information request to local authorities. Now, critical race theory is syn synonymous with the idea that white people, the accident of birth, your, the skin colour you're born with, give you structural advantages in society. And I tell you what, I'll take you up to County Durham, former pit villages, and show you the advantages of structural society be from being white up there. It legitimises the concept of this white privilege thing. And earlier this year, the former education secretary, he's now Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, said that young people aren't snowflakes and schools must teach children how to think, not what to think. 
Well, to analyse these findings, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Professor of Politics at the University of London, Eric Kaufman. Eric, thank you very much for your time. Could you actually just tell my viewers, go back to basics, and actually tell my viewers what critical race theory actually seeks to promote? So critical race theory essentially says that any disparities uh, between racial groups are essentially a result of what they call structures and, and unconscious biases that reproduce these disadvantages and hierarchies over time. Uh, so they would not pay any attention to other explanations for gaps in racial outcomes, be it in education or income, that might have to do with whether a group derived rich or poor in a country, uh, the values that may uh, hold within a group, whether this be, you know, and, and we could look at Jews, we can look at ethnic groups and ask, you know, why do some ethnic groups do better than others? That they're not interested in, but they are only interested in gaps between whites and people of color. Um, so yeah, this is really a very unscientific approach, which sort of says that all of these gaps are a as a result of these unconscious biases and uh, invisible structures that somehow we can't measure or test in any scientific way, but hey, we just have to believe they're there. Um, and so what they want to do is somehow dismantle these structures based, again, on untested and unscientific approaches, such as changing the meaning of words uh, or introducing certain forms of teaching into classrooms, uh, emphasizing things such as white privilege, unconscious bias. Again, a lot of these things have even been debunked uh, through, uh, through sort of more rigorous forms of testing, but they persist uh, with these uh, concepts. Eric, I, riddle me this. If we consider that the definition of racism here is prejudice, discrimination or antagonism by an individual community or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, how is this not racism? Well, I think it is. Um, it, it's not treating people equally. So if it's targeting, if it's suggesting that whites are distinctively racist and ignoring the fact that other groups are also racist. In fact, a study um, out of the Henry Jackson Society showed that more, uh, you know, more hate crime was committed by um, non-whites than by whites if you consider their share of the population. But this is completely elided into a very binary majority, minority, black and white approach. So yeah, I, I do think it is unequal treatment by race and can be classified as a form of racism in this sort of traditional definition of racism, which is individual uh, hatred and prejudice towards another individual on the basis of race. So if a council, if a local authority endorse the teaching of critical race theory, are these schools actually obliged to teach it? Or do you find actually the, the, there is a real activism within the schools themselves clambering over each other to actually do this? There's a lot of receptivity, I think, amongst certain teachers, not all teachers, certain teachers uh, who are very receptive to this ideology, which I've termed cultural socialism. It's based on the idea that rectifying any inequalities on the basis of race or gender or, or sexuality is the most important value. Protecting such groups from harm, including the harm of being offended by speech, is the most important value. And so you move heaven and earth in order uh, to achieve that. So yeah, I, the, the other thing I would add is this 23%, people shouldn't imagine that only 23% of schools are getting this. And in fact, I've seen data at which I can't yet release. This 23% is simply a, a share of those who responded to the FOI request, which is a minority of councils. And actually, the, people should understand that the, the levels of teaching of critical race theory are much higher than this 23%, and that will become clear uh, in the future. But uh, this is actually very widespread. Uh, we've seen pushback against Stonewall in their attempts to introduce uh, you know, some of the sort of pro-trans uh, ideas into organizations. I don't think we've even begun to uncover the scale of this teaching that's going on in British schools, I think people would be shocked if they understood the actual level to which this has penetrated into the schools. Well, Eric, that's a very depressing conversation that we've just had, but I thank you all the same for your insight and uh, actually shining a light on this issue. That was Professor of Politics at the University of London, Eric Kaufman. Thank you for your time. You're with GB News on telly and DAB Radio. Next, we're going to be discussing the Sizewell C nuclear power plant, which has been given a green light by the government. It'll be built next to the existing Sizewell B, which is still, and Sizewell A, which are there, which have been de decommissioned, I believe. 
but this comes in light of campaigners on the Suffolk coast actually being opposed to it, so we'll have that debate. But first of all, let's have a check on the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Thank you very much, Darren. It's 2.33. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. Queues to the port of Dover have been reduced down to around an hour after two days of severe delays for travellers and lorry drivers. Officials at the port say they've worked around the clock to clear both freight and tourist traffic in Dover. Additional checks on the border post-Brexit and understaffing of French officials had been blamed for the delays, which saw up to 18 hours for some travellers. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have vowed to toughen controls on migration as part of their bids to become next Tory leader and Prime Minister. Mr Sunak said he would tighten the definition of who qualifies for asylum and introduce a cap on refugee numbers. Liz Truss said she would extend the UK's Rwanda asylum plan and increase the number of Border Force staff. More than 14,000 migrants have crossed the Channel on small boats so far this year. President Zelensky has called attacks on the Ukrainian city of Odessa blatant barbarism days after a deal had been struck allowing for the export of grain from the country. Russia claims it hit a Ukrainian military boat in the port. Despite the attack, officials say preparations to resume grain shipments were continuing. The deal between Ukraine and Russia had been hailed as a breakthrough that would help ease increasing global food prices. Wildfires in Greece have destroyed homes on the island of Lesbos. Authorities have evacuated the popular tourist resort of Vatera as firefighters tackle the flames. The fire started in the island's mountains before spreading rapidly due to strong winds. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Welcome back. It's been confirmed that tennis ace Novak Djokovic will not be allowed to play at the US Open next month due to his refusal to get the coronavirus vaccine. The tournament's organisers have confirmed that they will follow the US government's rules on non-citizens having to be fully vaccinated in order to enter the country. Quite ironic at a time when the US president, of course, has coronavirus despite being jabbed more times than a pincushion. But this means he cannot compete at the tournament he has won three times, folks. 
So my next discussion is all about choice when it comes to taking the jab. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the author of A State of Fear, How the UK Government Weaponised Fear During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Laura Dodsworth. Laura, what were your first thoughts? Were they much like mine, which is, you know, you can be vaccinated to high heaven and someone like Djokovic isn't at risk, is he? No, I mean, I think you just made an excellent comparison. Um, we've got the US, which is barring travellers from entry if they don't have the COVID-19 vaccine. While they have a president who is fully vaccinated and wears a mask to boot, who has COVID. Now, the thing about the COVID-19 vaccine is it doesn't stop you from catching COVID and it doesn't prevent transmission. The, C the CDC makes it very clear on its website that you cannot enter the country without a vaccination, but it doesn't say why. Now, I know this will seem to many people like it's self-evident, but the fact is there's no good hard scientific justification from barring people for travelling if they don't have COVID. In fact, here in the UK, the UK Parliament's Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee asked the UK government to provide the scientific case when it had put forward vaccine passports. The UK government was not able to put forward a strong scientific case for vaccine passports. Now, if there's no hard scientific reason, what is the reason? The reason is actually a behavioural science reason. If you look at reports that have been produced by the nudges, the behavioural scientists for the World Health Organization of the different countries, you'll see what they try to do is harness social norms. This is our need to conform to behave the same as others, and they want us to believe in the social benefits of the vaccine. When Novak Djokovic refuses the vaccine, what he's doing is putting his own autonomy and self-determination before social norms. So as much as they want to harness social norms, Inconveniently for public health authorities, Djokovic won't be harnessed. He just won't put on those reins. Now they're seeing him as a kind of a stubborn mule who should be excluded. And you know, the need to belong is an incredibly important foundational human psychological need. But he's not a stubborn mule. You know, if we look at him physically, he's more like a racehorse. He's actually had COVID, um, so he will have long lasting immunity protection. He's also at the peak of physical condition. Not letting him in is about deliberately punishing him. It's about excluding him, to, about jeopardising him professionally. And it's actually supposed to send a signal to all of us that if you don't follow the rules, you get excluded and there are consequences. I okay. think it's mean and it increasingly looks like an absurd rule. A lot of my viewers, though, Laura, will be saying, look, I, I think you've got a point there, you know, that this, this bloke is potentially a lot fitter than most of us, I think it's safe to say. But actually, they will be of the view that it's selfish not to get the vaccine. And that actually, the, the fact of the matter is that whilst the vaccine doesn't stop you getting COVID, it does stop the more serious side effects. So what do you say to that argument? Well, I can really understand that argument. Nobody likes somebody who's selfish and won't do what's best for others collectively. But... The fact is, as the vaccine doesn't stop you from transmitting COVID, what it does is to mitigate the symptoms in the individual. We shouldn't be worried about how we're affecting other people. The fact is, Novak Djokovic is bearing the risk. He is bearing the risk of not being vaccinated. And that's a decision that he must make. And in fact, informed medical consent is one of the bedrocks of modern medicine. He isn't jeopardising other people's health. Every single competitor or ball boy and girl or spectator in the crowd or person who comes into contact with him at the airline has also chosen to have the vaccine so they can have the benefits that the vaccine confers upon them. It's down to the individual to choose whether to be vaccinated and to have the benefits it confers. Djokovic isn't really impacting other people, except in terms of the signal that he's sending out, which is that self-determination can trump a rather bullying and coercive public policy. Yeah, Laura, in your book, you, you talk about the way in which fear was, was weaponized to terrify us all to our wit's end. But I'm wondering, how fearful are you of the, the, the moves, potentially, there have been calls for these so-called climate lockdowns and now... We hear people wax lyrical about this monkeypox thing. And I just fear that actually we're getting to a point now where there's mass media hysteria. The media are clambering over each other to try and find a story that they can use to actually terrify the public with. 
And I don't see this mm. getting better anytime soon. Have we lost our sense of individual personal responsibility a little bit here? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about something really broad there, a whole um, culture of fear, the politics of fear. I think we have to be careful to distinguish what be between what governments do deliberately and what journalists do, because they're different things. So, for instance, the UK government hasn't been hysteric about monkeypox at all. Not at all. There's been a very watchful and sensible approach to monitoring the disease. Um, whereas you wouldn't get that same impression from some of the media headlines about monkeypox. It's also, it's also the same with climate. Now, I think that a lot of this comes from... Uh, clickbait, you know, um, fear sells. It sells better than sex. You know, I kind of long for the days of page three when all we had to worry about was bare boobs in the news. Now it's just constant diet of fear. In fact, there was a Times headline um, about Rishi Sunak. I don't remember the exact words, but he was talking about us being on a crisis footing of constant emergencies. I mean, personally, I thirst for political leaders that instead of trying to sell themselves on the basis of what we need to be frightened of, would set up really positive visions for where we want to be as a country. I think that um, while it still carries some people along with it, you know, there's always going to be an audience for fear. Some of us feel, com you know, com increasingly disenfranchised by the hysterical language. Also, it's a bit like Chicken Little, you know, we start we start noticing when the sky doesn't fall down. So uh, fear is, it's an asset, uh, it's, it's a depreciating asset. You can't keep using it in the same thing forever. You know, um, Pete Hitchens tweeted today some old examples about um, climate change from the BBC and some other magazines where ice ages were predicted just, you know, a couple of decades ago. You know, the country isn't one mile under, um, under ice and maybe the current predictions will come true, maybe they won't, but the problem with the constant doomsayers um, and the fear mongering is that we start looking back at all of these schedules of apocalypse that have been, been missed. You don't want to be the boy who cries wolf. The, the US will drop its travel restrictions. It will do ultimately. And in the end, the way it's treated Djokovic is going to look petty and tyrannical. Mm, indeed. Now, Laura, I thought you were about to say there Rishi Sunak was campaigning to bring back page three for a minute. But yes, I do think there is a real problem. There is a real problem, isn't there, with, with the, the, the pandering to, to basically get those clicks in, to, to really exacerbate the, the fear around these issues. Because there is even a continued hysteria around COVID. And I'm just wondering, have you any thoughts on when that will come to pass? I think there will be, um, you know, scientists are predicting that there'll be another wave this winter. Let's look at what the Danish government is saying, because they're being incredibly measured. In fact, they've changed their vaccination strategy. The US could really learn from this. So the Danish Health Authority has said that despite their predictions that there will be a new wave this winter, they are using the vaccines in order to mitigate serious illness and hospitalizations rather than to prevent transmission. And they are very clear on their official page that the vaccination is voluntary. I think this is a message that is going to inspire trust in their health authority. Now, here in the UK, recently we've had many calls in the media from um, SAGE and independent SAGE scientists from across the board, actually, asking for the reintroduction of restrictions, social distancing, yeah. masks, etc. Now, the current wave has actually peaked, it would appear, from ONS data. And it did all of that without the reintroduction of restrictions. I think mm -hmm. that some people are enthralled to an illusion of control, which is something that happens naturally when times are frightening. Infection is frightening, a pandemic is frightening, and people want to believe that they can exert a control in order to mitigate that fear. Now, there are things that we can do to mitigate pandemics, and I'm not somebody who would say there should never be any form of uh, protections and restrictions, but we can see from the recent wave that they will peak and trough on their own without masks, without lockdowns. Indeed. Indeed. And let's just hope that we can maintain a kind of a balanced attitude going into this winter when we're really seeing what the economic and educational and societal disruption has been. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the education side of it breaks my heart, Laura, but there we are. That was the author of A State of Fear, How the UK Government Weaponised Fear During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Laura Dodsworth. Thank you very much for your time, Laura. Now, folks, I'm going to get the views of my in-studio guest, Victoria Houston. Victoria, you heard what Laura had to say there. Are you optimistic that the message of, we hark back to Margaret Thatcher throughout this leadership campaign, but that message of personal responsibility, is that lost in the modern world? Well, I think it certainly became very much obscured during the pandemic. And I'm afraid 
that public health authorities in Britain and possibly even more so in the United States have really discredited themselves with the way they behaved on some of these measures and advice they were giving to governments that became, essentially became politicised and um, people have lost trust in those messages. And that's extremely risky because public health is actually very important. It's, it's an important service mm -hmm. in, um, in, a, in, a, in a country because there are times where personal responsibility and personal decision making isn't all you need. You do have times where collective action is required and government advice is very important. But now I'm afraid the public health authorities have discredited themselves so that that trust has been lost and a lot of people will now be taking all those messages with a pinch of salt. And in particular in Britain, the public health authorities had got themselves far too bogged down in trying to micromanage the minutiae of people's lives, what they could eat. Um, what benches you could sit on. How, how many units of alcohol uh, a week you should drink and so on. And took their, eye, took their eye off the ball when the pandemic came. They were unprepared um, and hadn't put in place the necessary preparations for it because they were too worried about micromanaging people's lifestyles. And that, I think, needs to change. Absolutely, because, I mean, the World Health Organization is one organization, right, focused far too much, if you ask me, on things like vaping, on things yeah. like nanny state issues around sugar and people being too fat and all the rest of it. What about pandemics, right? They're pretty serious. Exactly. And that's the sort of paradigm example where collective action and a public health response is required. And in a lot of ways, they fell short and ended up relying on um, fear-mongering and scare tactics. Victoria Houston, thank you very much. We'll be coming back to Victoria throughout the show. Now, folks, Southwark Council in London has defended its inclusion charter for schools, which encourages them not to exclude disruptive children after criticism from the government school behaviours are, who warned the move risks creating less safe schools where bad behaviour is tolerated. A number of schools in Southwark have responded by saying that they will continue to use exclusions as a last for resort for particularly poor behaviour. Now, this raises questions on whether exclusions are effective, necessary and in the interests of the pupil and school as well as the local area. To answer these questions, I'm joined by education consultant Barry Smith. Barry Smith, thank you very much for your time. Do you agree that schools should have the right to, to exclude pupils for bad behaviour, especially if they put the safety and education of other pupils at risk? Of course. <laughs> We've got to teach kids that actions have consequences. And if we do anything else than that, what we're teaching kids that, yeah, you do it how you like, it's OK. There will no, there will, there's no end point. Um, we've got to have, you know, we've got to take care of the, the small details at the beginning because, yes, the ultimate, and it's always a last deterrent. No school jumps in and goes, yeah, we're going to permanently exclude a kid um, willingly, and it's, it's, it's never the, the option of first resort. So when schools do that, there's been a whole raft of measures that have gone in behind that to support the child, to support the family, to make sure that we don't permanently exclude children. Yeah, you know what, though, Barry? I think a lot of people watching the show today are of the view that actually behaviour, bad behaviour, and the lack of respect from kids is a real problem in today's day and age. Why do you think it is that behaviour... Is getting seems to be at least getting worse in schools. Baby is dreadful in many many schools. Uh, schools are frightened to uh, use sanctions very often because they fear that Ofsted will look badly upon them. Uh, Ofsted are very they are constantly analysing the number of detentions, the number of internal isolations that are used, um, and, and then we analyse, we break down who were the children who were being punished. So schools are reluctant to issue sanctions. Um, there's an awful lot of pressure on schools to have positive PR. Positive PR because they want bums on seats, they want families to sign up to go to their particular school, uh, they want to have a really good PR, um, a really good Ofsted report. So it goes on. There's a breakdown in adult authority very often, and head teachers are often scared to say, OK, look, you know, we're the adults, you're the children. Uh, relationships are important, but the hierarchy has to be that the adult is the boss. That isn't draconian, that isn't us being buddy boys, that's us going, no, because we're grown-ups and grown-ups guide and protect children. That's our job. Mm. Right. Do you reckon there is truth to Southwark Council saying, well, 
I'm sorry, but excluding children from school means that you actually, the knock-on effects of that are that the, these kids fall out of society altogether. Well, you have to look, it, it, you've got no idea how difficult it is to permanently exclude a child. It takes an awful lot. About 34% of permanent exclusions are, um, the basis is what we call um, um, uh, persistent disruptive um, behaviour. So it's kids being really difficult, really contrarian, uh, really defied for weeks and months and years on end. And sometimes a permanent exclusion may be the best thing for them. Because otherwise, if that kid's going to go through 11 years of education where he's not engaging and he's not working, he's not learning, if all he's learning is, yeah, the adults, the teachers, they're your boss, but you don't do what you're told ever, well, what kind of life is that kid going to have in future? Yes, you know, remember as well, only about half the year are kids in school. The other half of the year, they're out and about, they're mm -hmm. doing whatever they do. What are the external influences they're going on with those kids? Their behavior in school, they don't leave school and then become model citizens. You know, they're, they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing outside of school as well. Yeah, so then how much is this, does the responsibility actually lie with the parents? You know, the, the old saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Is it actually a, a parenting that's a problem in modern life? Inevitably, yeah. Inevitably, your parents give you your values. Uh, remember, something like 90%, 90% of 12-year-olds uh, have a media profile, a social media profile. So kids are going home from school and they're spending a hell of a lot of time on social media or they're gaming. They're not necessarily communicating with their families very much. Yeah. Um, and I'm always going to say that a school culture has to be stronger than the culture of the street because what is acceptable outside and wider society it shouldn't be acceptable in school because it's not very nice. We need to explicitly teach kids, look, this is a culture built upon genuine mutual respect. We're very, very polite to you. Yeah. You're very, very polite to us. But we have to teach kids that. It's a massive part of, uh, of our curriculum, if you like. Barry, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you very much for giving us your insight. That was the education consultant, Barry Smith, there. Now, folks, you're watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I thank you very much. Here is a weather update. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking very wet and thundery in the northwest, warm sunshine in the southeast. Let's take a look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it will be often cloudy with some rain at times, as well as blustery winds. The rain shouldn't be particularly heavy though. Meanwhile, in the southeast, and after a hot day, it will stay fine and very warm through the evening, with some further sunshine for most. A cloudier picture across Wales. Here there will be some blustery winds, especially around the coasts and over the mountains, with some spells of rain. It will also be largely cloudy around Birmingham and in the West Midlands, whilst it will be drier and less windy than further west. A few spots of rain are possible this evening. It's looking similar around northeast England, where there'll be quite a bit of cloud this evening and some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times, with blustery winds too. A wet end to the day across Scotland with heavy and thundery spells of rain. A warning has been issued for southwestern Scotland where impacts are likely from the rain. There'll also be some impacts from the rain for Northern Ireland, although the worst of this should have cleared here by this evening, albeit with some showers following. A little rain spreads across the UK overnight, whilst in Scotland the rain will continue to be heavy and thundery at times. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly, DAB and online. In the next hour, we'll be discussing our borders and how we should go about controlling them. And we'll also bring you the latest on this monkeypox as it was declared a global health emergency by the World Health Organization. And we'll be talking about Dutch farmers protesting against emission targets. Are they actually fighting for all of us? But first, folks, here's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's three o'clock. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. Queues to the port of Dover have been reduced to around an hour, but attention has now moved to Folkestone and the Eurotunnel, where drivers are facing a third day of lengthy delays. The AA called Folkestone the new hotspot of holiday hell, warning travellers were waiting several hours to get to the Eurotunnel terminal. The Highways Agency has warned of severe delays in Kent for people heading to either terminal. Additional checks on the border post-Brexit and understaffing of French officials had been blamed for the delays of up to 18 hours for some travellers yesterday. But travel editor at The Independent, Simon Calder, says the reality of the situation is different. Because some of the ideas that this is all the French and they could just wave us through, that is absolutely not the case. Um, and it's quite interesting that, um, well, the government will be delighted with this headline from the front page of the Sunday Times, a French insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos. British insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos is actually the reality. The Board of Cricket Scotland has resigned ahead of the publication of an independent review into racism. The review has been conducted after Scotland's all-time leading wicket-taker, Majid Hack, told Sky Sports News that Cricket Scotland was institutionally racist. In a letter, the board apologised and said the review would provide a watershed moment for Scottish sport. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have vowed to toughen controls on migration as part of their bids to become next Tory leader and Prime Minister. Mr Sunak said he would tighten the definition of who qualifies for asylum and introduce a cap on refugee numbers. Liz Truss said she would extend the UK's Rwanda asylum plan and increase the number of Border Force staff. More than 14,000 migrants have crossed the Channel on small boats so far this year. Meanwhile, the public is split on who would make a better prime minister. An opinion survey of 2,000 adults found 43% back the former chancellor, compared to 36% for the foreign secretary. This is in contrast to Conservative Party members, where a YouGov poll has placed Liz Truss 24 points ahead of Rishi Sunak. Earlier, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Therese Coffey, outlined why she is backing Liz Truss to become prime minister. Liz a long time and uh, she's one of my closest friends in politics and it's not just for that reason, far from it. It's because I know that she has delivered, 
and she's been in the cabinet since 2014. She's uh, served in five different roles and was an education minister before there. And whatever you can do, say about Liz, she absolutely delivers. Meanwhile, Conservative MP Richard Holden outlined why he is supporting Rishi Sunak. She was back Brexit all the way through. Uh, he's not a late convert. He was uh, putting himself under real strain as a brand new MP in 2016 to really go and back it. Secondly, I think he's got a proper plan for the economy. Deal with inflation first, then move on to tax cuts. Uh, and I think that's a sensible way to go. It's a sort of way Mrs Thatcher would have gone about it. Wildfires in Greece have destroyed homes on the island of Lesbos. Authorities have evacuated the popular tourist resort of Vatera as firefighters tackle the flames. The fire started in the island's mountains before spreading rapidly due to strong winds. This comes as wildfires in other parts of the country over the past week have forced hundreds of people to flee. Kate Moss said she had to run away from a photo shoot after a man asked her to go topless when she was 15. In a rare, wide-ranging interview with BBC Radio 4 programme Desert Island Discs, the supermodel touched on numerous issues, such as her support for actor Johnny Depp during his recent libel trial. She also said she felt scapegoated by the media due to her drug use in the 1990s. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, let's get straight back to Darren. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up over this next hour. We'll be taking a look at how we should control our borders and who is really coming to the UK. Liz Truss has today pledged more Rwanda-style schemes to tackle illegal immigration, but she soon act laid out a 10-point plan to curb illegal immigration too. Also, monkeypox has been declared a global health emergency by the World Health Organization. We'll be asking what is monkeypox and how can we keep it from infecting us. And we'll be talking about those Dutch farmers who have been protesting against emissions targets. I'll be discussing with Brendan O'Neill if we're likely to see similar protests here in Britain. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. As ever, your mouth is more important than mine. I'd love to know your thoughts on what we're discussing this afternoon. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Watch us on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of cracking content on our page. Cheers very much. Now, what feels like the never-ending issue that is the migrant crisis next? It's continued to call into question the UK government's ability to control our borders. We got Brexit done, we ended the free movement of people, we implemented a £120 million plan to send migrants to Rwanda, yet we still find ourselves in a position where we can't get to grips with illegal immigration. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Stephen Wolfe, Director at the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Steve Valdez-Simmons, a Refugee and Asylum Rights Director at Amnesty International, and Daniel Pryor, the Head of Research at the Adam Smith Institute. And Victoria Houston joins me from the IEA in the studio. Now, Boris Johnson wrote in The Telegraph that he sorted illegal immigration. Has he, Mr Wolfe? We'll start with you. Absolutely not. It's very clear from the past few years that we've had over 15,000 migrants crossing the channel this year. We've had 18,000 last year. So the numbers are huge. To say that he's tackled uh, illegal migration into this country is incorrect. And for those that continually say just simply because you are going to claim asylum into the UK once you arrive, you are not illegal, that is not technically a legal definition at all. Of course, once you arrive, you make that claim of asylum. But in the process, it's up to countries to define whether you are illegal or not to do so. And so he's failed, absolutely. He's not changed the law enough, enough to be able to tackle it. He's not provided the resources, as the latest re report, uh, as we heard over the last couple of days, which looked at the Home Office failures on board, board the border force. He can't do it. He hasn't done it. And it's going to be very difficult for anyone to try and do this in the future. Steve Valdez simmons there. I want to bring you in from Amnesty, the Amnesty perspective. Who is actually coming here to the UK? Because a lot of my viewers, Steve, are deeply frustrated 
with this idea that actually the United Kingdom, we are basically borderless Britain. Well, we're not borderless Britain. It's true that managing this, the situation of people who enter this country to claim asylum, that has gone out of the window. But we should reflect upon the fact people are entitled to seek asylum in this country, just as they're entitled to seek asylum in others. Very few people do seek asylum here. The majority of people whose, whose asylum claims are determined by the Home Office are found to be refugees. And yet there is no means provided by the Home Office for anyone to come here for the purpose of seeking asylum, but for making a journey which is not authorised or permitted in advance. So that is why people come by small boats and indeed other means without invitation. They have no choice. Daniel Pryor, France, it, to many of my viewers who go on holiday there, is a perfectly lovely country. And why I think the, the pro-emigration side of the argument failed to actually make a case for why the United Kingdom has to be the final destination. Uh, and I mean, France, alongside Germany, Spain, and many other countries in Europe, do accept far more asylum claims than we do. Globally, most asylum seekers end up in countries that neighbor the one they left, places like Turkey and Pakistan. But if the UK just flat out refuses to offer asylum seekers protection, then why should France? Why should Germany? Why should Poland, which has taken in over a million Ukrainian refugees? In the end, I think either we all do our bit or refugees end up having no protection from war and persecution at all. The whole international refugee and asylum system works on the basis that everyone does their bit. Uh, and I'm not comfortable with us shirking on that. I don't think most other people are. There has to be a better answer than it's all someone else's problem. And I think the creation of proper safe legal routes, which we don't really have unless you're Ukrainian or uh, a small number of Afghans, uh, we really need to be serious about creating alternatives so that we take back control of the channel from these smugglers. So, Victoria Houston, is the United Kingdom, are we guilty of a dereliction of duty when it comes to our asylum policy? Well, I think there are certainly some aspects of it that are not being well managed. For example, the removal of unsuccessful asylum seekers has basically ground to a standstill. That almost never happens. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the channel boat problem is, is more, I think, an outworking of the way the asylum system at a global level that Daniel was referring to is not really working in the modern era where um, there are literally millions and millions of people living on this planet mm -hmm. who would rather not live where they are yeah. and now have greater mobility, partly because actually there's, there's more wealth um, available in those desperately poor countries. There's, there's now a sufficient wealth for some of them that they can actually pay the people smugglers or get themselves um, to the borders of Europe in pursuit of a better life. Now, question whether the historic systems for dealing with refugees are actually capable of dealing th with this new um, way in which global movements of people are actually happening. Yeah, so Stephen Wolf, then, coming back to you, I just, a lot of my viewers will be saying, hang on a minute, I'm hearing what you're all saying. But at this time, we've got a housing crisis. We've got a dentist crisis. We've got a healthcare crisis. We've got a cost of living crisis. We've got an energy crisis. Well, can it take on more people at this time? And I think they've got a valid point. I mean, I've got to take on Steve Aldous's point that very few uh, asylum seekers come to this country. Since 2001, 865,000 people have made applications for asylum. 55,000 did so last year, and the average annual numbers is 43,600. Our research shows that it costs in the first year, ranging from collection to housing and hospitals and schools and funding them and feeding them, costs around £40,000 per asylum applicant in the first year. If you then add on those who are coming in the scheme this year from the Ukraine, those that we're allowing from the Afghan, small numbers, and also those coming from Hong Kong, we'll estimate around 200,000 will come in either through the illegal routes, the asylum applications, all those schemes. That's a cost of 8 billion, 8 billion pounds that could be used 
on services to house. For example, the 235,000 people born in this country living with their children or on their own in just bedsits. We have to consider the cost, the numbers. And whilst Daniel is correct to a certain extent in saying that when we look at Germany and, and France, they've taken more, but the reason Germany took more is because of Merkel's monumental madness in 2014 and 15 of opening the whole of the borders to the whole world in response to the Syrian crisis. And as we now know, far more people from across the countries came and two and a half million people entered Germany. We could not cope with that if we have the same system that they're proposing at the moment from the Labour Party or indeed from what I can see from Rishi Sunak's proposals too. So, Stephen, then a lot of bleeding heart liberals, though, will be shouting at their television sets right now and saying we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We should absolutely be following Daniel Pryor's advice and actually leading the way in, in our duty and responsibility to people from around the world who need to seek refuge. No one's ever said that we shouldn't look after people that come from different parts of the world in a silent process or otherwise. I think we're showing that very clearly in the way that we treat those from Ukraine. The question is really the numbers, where they're coming from and how they, can we cope. We talk ourselves about the fifth largest economy in the world and yet we're seeing food banks rise all the time. We're seeing pension poverty all the time. We're seeing people struggle not to be able to get their first homes or even be able to afford rent. We're seeing gas prices increase. There has to come a time when people question whether we look after those on our own in our own countries or whether we simply open the borders like Germany did and take everybody in and say, hey, let's just hope it all works out well. So, Daniel Pryor, do you care more about people from around the world than British citizens here? I don't think the two concerns are mutually exclusive, and we have to deal with reality here. It might be that if deterrence would work, that would be one option, but I just don't think that it does work. If Rwanda flights ever get off the ground, uh, they recently said they could only take about 200 people for a £120 million down payment. That's taxpayers' money going towards that. But it's more fundamental than that. All of the research, including some from the Home Office itself, suggests that asylum seekers don't know the first thing about our asylum regime. They don't sit in Calais camps watching debates on BBC Parliament. And if you don't know a deterrent even exists, how is it supposed to deter you in the first place? What motivates these people, by and large, to come to Britain specifically are connections to family and friends, speaking English but perhaps not speaking French, previous work with our military in the case of Afghanistan, or the quite simple belief that the UK is a safe, tolerant and democratic country. I think that we have to deal with reality here, and that is that the deterrence policies that have been put in place most recently with the Borders Act, but also in previous years, don't actually stop these channel crossings, and they don't stop irregular migration flows or anything like that. All they end up doing is driving more people into the hands of smugglers rather than being able to take proper regulated routes, which is what people from across the political spectrum have been calling for on this. So, Steve Valdez-Simmons, bringing you back in, isn't there a, a, a problem here where a, a nation, and it, you know, this is rumoured to have been a quote attached to former President Reagan, where actually a nation that can't control its borders is not a nation state? And if we don't know who's coming here, right, how can we be certain that our national security isn't impacted? Well, we've had people coming to this country seeking asylum for, as Daniel mentioned, for 20 years. He talked back to a time when actually the number of people who came to this country seeking asylum was far, far greater than we see now or have seen for very many years. So actually, goodness knows why we should be struggling at this particular time when asylum claims do remain relatively low. The reality is that what we have done over the last three years in particular is stop processing claims. People are being held in backlogs at the moment in very large numbers. The backlog has ballooned over the time of the current Home Secretary. And now we have a struggling asylum system, absolutely, because it's not made decisions on people's claims. It is having to pay to accommodate them. And if it had only got on and done its job of deciding who should get to stay and who should not, it could get people out of the system, either fending for themselves or look at the issue of returns. If we are not prepared to have a system that is functioning like that, then no, of course we're not going to be in control. We have ceded complete control of this, not to people seeking asylum. They're just vulnerable and completely at, at sea. Literally, we've okay. ceded control to people smugglers and traffickers. 
and their business is thriving while we ignore our responsibilities. So Stephen Wolf, then, we're just ignoring our responsibilities here and actually there shouldn't be any worries about national security concerns, which many of my viewers actually do have. Well, there are uh, national security concerns, but I would say that, like, like others, that the numbers that are coming in are generally not going to be hundreds of thousands of terrorists crossing the border, but there may well be one or two. So there is a concern that we have to address there. But a lot on, of people on would say one or two too many, right? Perhaps, perhaps, but we, we have to monitor that, and that is a concern that the government should work with, with the security services. But when we look at those coming over, if you, even if you consider the past few years, on average, the past three years, we've had 15,000 asylum applications refused, and that's after appeal. It's generally about a quarter, 20% to 25%. 15,000 people refused, we're not removing them. So there you have a problem there, too. There's roughly around 50,000 in the past three to four years who are just not being uh, removed from the country, and that's the official language that we use. And there is a big concern, too. So you're getting that as the backlog. And, and Steve is correct in the sense that if you look at 2001 and when we had 79,000 asylum applicants and 2002 when we had 103,000 applicants under Tony Blair's government, but that followed initially by a quite dramatic drop to around 30,000. It's increased over the past few years because the people smugglers and traffickers have got cleverer. They have worked out their routes. The vast majority are coming from Iran and Iraq and now ca catching up with them is Afghanistan, and we have significant numbers from Africa. So they're very smart. The smugglers know what they want, and the reason they know that they can offer a good package is because we do not deport those who refused applications, and we do not send out any deterrence methods for them either. It's easy. Once you get here, they say, you'll never leave, and it's true. So, Victoria Houston, is it not the case that, you know, leaving behind the cheeses, wines and baguettes in France for bed, board and benefits here in Britain have been put up in pretty nice hotels and all the rest of it. Is that the draw? Well, I think certainly, I think, you know, it's certainly fair to say I don't think these um, people in the boats have an intimate understanding of the asylum system in the UK. I doubt if many practising lawyers would claim to fully understand mm. the arcanery of it. However, I think they do know that the rates of return are very low. Yep. And then if you can get here, your chances of staying are very good. And in some ways as well, I think the discussion about asylum seekers is, is only one very small part of the wider question about immigration. We're talking there thousands, tens of thousands. But last year, the UK issued 1.5 million visas in the different various capacities for people to move to this country. And I think while the, the asylum seekers and the, and the people in the boats in the channel is a very emotive question, there are much bigger questions about what our immigration policy policy should be across the board because a lot of people are very worried about it and I think a lot of people on the more libertarian side would say well we, sh we should have we should open our borders and invite more people to come um, and, and that would help with our economy but what worries me is that we've had very very high levels of immigration in the millions over the past couple of decades and our productivity uh, growth is is worse than ever so I, I think there are some really, really important questions that we need to be asking about immigration more widely, as well as the specific security concerns about the integrity of the border. Indeed, right. We're going to have to leave it there, folks. But that was Victoria Houston in the studio there and Stephen Wolf, Director at the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Daniel Pryor at the Adam Smith Institute and Stephen Valdez-Simmons, Refugee and Asylum Rights Director at Amnesty. Now, folks, you're with GB News on telly and DAB radio. Next, we're going to be talking about that monkeypox business. It came as the World Health Organization declared the global outbreak a health emergency. There are more than 2,200 confirmed cases in Britain. So does that number make it a crisis here? We'll be discussing that after the break. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking very wet and thundery in the northwest, warm sunshine in the southeast. Let's take a look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it will be often cloudy with some rain at times, as well as blustery winds. The rain shouldn't be particularly heavy though. Meanwhile, in the southeast, and after a hot day, it will stay fine and very warm through the evening, with some further sunshine for most. A cloudier picture across Wales. Here there will be some blustery winds, especially around the coasts and over the mountains, with some spells of rain. 
It will also be largely cloudy around Birmingham and in the West Midlands, whilst it will be drier and less windy than further west. A few spots of rain are possible this evening. It's looking similar around northeast England, where there'll be quite a bit of cloud this evening and some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times with blustery winds too. A wet end to the day across Scotland with heavy and thundery spells of rain. A warning has been issued for southwestern Scotland, where impacts are likely from the rain. There'll also be some impacts from the rain for Northern Ireland, although the worst of this should have cleared here by this evening, albeit with some showers following. A little rain spreads across the UK overnight, whilst in Scotland the rain will continue to be heavy and thundery at times. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. Welcome back. The World Health Organization has declared the recent monkeypox outbreak a global health emergency, the highest alert the WHO can actually issue after a rise in cases. Let's hear what the Director General of the World Health Organization said yesterday. We have an outbreak that has spread around the world rapidly through new modes of transmission about which we understand too little and which meets the criteria in the international health regulations. For all of these reasons, I have decided that the global monkeypox outbreak represents a public health emergency of international concern. 
So, how much is monkeypox a cause for concern? To provide us with the answer to that question, I'm joined by Professor Andrew Preston, a microbiologist at the University of Bath. Now, could we actually start by just setting out what monkeypox actually is and what the symptoms are? Because it does sound and look pretty awful. Yeah, it's an unpleasant illness. So, obviously, it's a viral disease, um, different from COVID. So yet another case of, of a virus just, you know, uh, moving from a normal animal host into the human population. And it gives rise to, to many of the classic sort of uh, infectious disease symptoms. So there'll be um, some fever involved. But the, the key ones really are the rash, which I think we've all seen pictures of. Uh, and indeed, as you're showing now, that really marks it out as being distinctive. And um, in most cases, it's, a, it's what we call a self-limiting disease, and most people will naturally recover from it without any medical intervention. Uh, in a small number of cases, it can go on, give rise to complications and be described as severe. But, but regardless of that, and I think probably most of us have seen some interviews with those that have recovered from monkeypox who have described a, a pretty harrowing and pretty unpleasant and very painful uh, illness whilst it lasted. And do these poxes that, that form, do they scar as well? Generally not. So it's not, it's not like the, the, the infamous smallpox as such. Um, I, I guess it depends on how much damage is done to the skin. So those more mild, sort of those white ones, would, would expect to heal for, for the most part. Uh, but some of the more severe ones, again, anything that damages the skin severely uh, can give rise to, to some uh, long-lasting, if not permanent, marking, yes. Yeah, and why is it, why is it the case that the NHS is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, prioritising a vaccine rollout among primarily men who have sex with men? It seems that the spillover from the animal host is primarily, you know, it's got into this particular contact network, which, as you say, is primarily uh, men who have sex with men. And so, uh, you know, particularly in Europe, uh, perhaps as many as 99% of the cases are thought to be in, in those in in that group and therefore uh, you know whilst it's a very very harrowing and worrying time for, for for that population of course what it does enable is to is, is a much more easy recognition of those who are perhaps at the, the greatest risk of contracting the virus and therefore we can target uh, interventions such as uh, health messaging um, advice on, on how to, to to look for signs of the disease and of course in this case vaccination yeah, because, I mean, for a lot of people, I think there'll be a concern around actually, you know, whether or not the, there is that targeting and people are being informed enough about these sorts of things, because to c declare it a global health emergency it sounds quite serious, no? It is. And, I think, you know, there's multiple factors behind that decision. And, and a really important part of it is the fact that we, we are now talking about it here today. So it's raising that awareness and, and, and really keeping it at the forefront of people's minds so that they, they can modify their behaviour if they're, if they're in one of the risk groups. Of course, you know, a real focus on, on looking for signs of infection and, and getting that treated and, of course, hopefully isolating if you do think that you've had it. And, and you know, I don't think anything actually is really going to change within the UK because we've been doing many of the things that that, that, that declaration of an emergency uh, requires states to do. But in other parts of the world where, of course, there's far less infrastructure and indeed there is unfortunately you know, a lot of sensitivity about you know, uh, homosexuality. And that makes getting that message across and the help to those communities, if it gets into those communities in other countries, particularly difficult. So that sensitivity is very important. Um, but the, but the, the declaration, as, as we've seen today, is really raising that awareness, perhaps, in, and, and will help stop it from getting into other countries at the moment uh, virus-free. But we're not going to see COVID-like restrictions, right, to stop the spread or anything of that like? No, this is an entirely different infection. And then, you know, COVID was, was, a, was, a, was an unfortunate, terrible mix of, of a virus that was spread by the very act of breathing, clearly sexual contact, as we think most cases are being spread, is, is a much more deliberate, avoidable um, action. And, of course, uh, the, the, the relatively high levels of uh, asymptomatic infection in, 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 with COVID, so people carrying the virus without really being aware of it and therefore spreading it very easily and very hard to trace. Uh, we're, we're perhaps not seeing that quite so much with monkeypox. So, so entirely different type of infection, 
But if we have a novel disease that we're not used to seeing here and it's clearly spreading within our community, that is certainly not something we want to ignore because that is how problems start to, to escalate and, and eventually get out of hand. And so, you know, whilst it's unfortunate it's got into a particular population within our communities at the moment, at the mo you know, th th there'll be a lot of uh, emphasis and, and it really is important that it stays within that population and, and eventually cleared from it rather than spilling out into those groups who are perhaps more at risk of those severe cases that we talked about uh, earlier. OK, Professor Andrew Preston, thank you very much for giving us your expertise there, microbiologist even, at the University of Bath. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we're going to be talking about your pension pots. Over the last year, pensioners have been feeling the pinch as their yearly income has fallen. So we're asking, should younger generations continue to prop up our pensioners through taxation and the so-called triple lock? We'll be talking about that after the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Darren, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 3.34. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. Disruption at the port of Dover has largely eased after two days of delays, but attention has now moved to Folkestone and the Euro Tunnel, where drivers are continuing to face problems. Delays in Dover have been reduced to around an hour after some drivers reported waiting up to 18 hours yesterday. However, now the AA has called Folkestone the new hotspot of holiday hell, warning travellers were waiting several hours to get to the Euro Tunnel terminal. The Highways Agency has warned of severe delays in Kent for people heading to either terminal. The Board of Cricket Scotland has resigned ahead of the publication of an independent review into racism. The review has been conducted after Scotland's all-time leading wicket-taker, Majid Hack, told Sky Sports News that Cricket Scotland was institutionally racist. In a letter to the board, apologised and said the review would provide a watershed moment for Scottish sport. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have vowed to toughen controls on migration as part of their bids to become next Tory leader and Prime Minister. Mr Sunak said he would tighten the definition of who qualifies for asylum and introduce a cap on refugee numbers. Liz Truss said she would extend the UK's Rwanda asylum plan and increase the number of Border Force staff. Kate Moss said she had to run away from a photo shoot after a man asked her to go topless when she was 15. In a rare, wide-ranging interview with BBC Radio 4 programme, Desert Island Discs, the supermodel touched on numerous issues, such as her support for actor Johnny Depp during his recent libel trial. She also said she felt scapegoated by the media due to her drug use in the 1990s. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Darren will be back in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News.
Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Welcome back. Over the last year, folks, pensioners have been feeling the pinch as their yearly income has fallen by around 600 quid. It's the cost of living and prices of essential items rising three times faster than the state pension. By the age of 85, pensioners will be £14,000 worse off after the suspension of the triple lock. That means that pensioners would need an additional £878 per year in order to keep up with the cost of living crisis. So who's responsible for filling the gap and how much of it should be paid by the youngest generations? How much support should pensioners realistically be able to expect? Well, joining me now to discuss this is the host and director of Reason, a conservative YouTube channel, Jess Gill, and the political commentator, Monica Ujak. Ooh, ooh, I can't say that. <laughs> Uj Karl Nita. I beg your pardon, Monica. Yes, Jess, every time. <laughs> I do beg your pardon. Where do you stand, Jess, on this? Do you think we should actually have the triple lock in place or do you see it as part of a wider intergenerational inequality problem? I just think this is completely unfair to young people. At the end of the day, everyone is suffering with the cost of living crisis and young people and just middle age workers aren't having their wages adjusted with inflation. Everyone's suffering during this. And I hate this idea of um, age warfare. I don't think it's fair that the state's created this problem, which is dividing people. Like, I don't want to, like, be beefing with my grandma on this issue, you know? And I think we need to support each other during this hard time. I don't think it's useful to be having a go at each other on this issue. I think we need to support um, old people as well as young people who are both very much impacted by this cost of living crisis. Monica, how about you then? Do you think the, is there any argument at all to say that there is a real deep intergenerational inequality here, that young people are paying far too much for what could be wealthy pensioners? I know one pensioner friend of mine describes his winter fuel allowance as his champagne fund. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think quite differently to Jess. I think it's our duty as young people to put the most vulnerable group um, to the top of our list of priorities when it comes to spending. Most of the elderly rely on the state pension as their main source of income. Um, and to take that away from the people who need it the most to me is completely foolish. You know, as a 24 year old, it would be really easy for me to say, well, it's my problem. Um, it's the, the elderly are struggling and it's not my responsibility to pick, on, pick up on the slack on behalf of them. Um, but that argument is so self-indulgent in nature um, and lacking an understanding of the importance that a state pension has in our society. Um, you know, state pensions are not a benefit. State pensions are earned and they're earned through taxes and a monthly payment into the system. Um, and a full pension takes 35 to 40 years of contributions and a lot of hard work to actually build itself up. Um, I think that for a 20-something year old who has had a couple of years of work at best, um, to say that that's, you know, that's okay is just, it's very entitled to me and self-indulgent, really. Jess, do you worry that this will come full circle, that actually this generation will will need to be supported, eventually you will retire, but... I worry that actually the retirement age will be so high, Jess, that many of us won't see our pensions at this rate. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. Like, we have an ageing population at the moment. And on the topic of um, helping the most vulnerable, one in four pensioners are millionaires. I think there should be a means-adjusted pension. At the end of the day, everyone's struggling. And when we're talking about, you know, when I get to 70-odd, who's going to afford... Who's going to pay for my pension? You know... My generation and your generation, Darren, um, Zoomers and Millennials, we're not reproducing at the same rate. No one is going to be able to pay for that support which we're paying for the boomers. And again, like, I don't think that's a sustainable way to support the elderly in society. 
Yeah, Jess, but what about the pensioners who, you know, they, you're right, they do own assets, they own houses, for example, but it's not pensioners' faults. For example, in if you bought your house under Margaret Thatcher's right to buy, that actually you've seen a massive increase in the, the, the worth of that asset, thanks to the housing crisis that we face in this country. You might be asset rich in that you have property, but you are ultimately cash poor. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a massive issue. I'm not blaming pensioners. I'm blaming the system that's created this problem. I think it's awful that pensioners have to have this gamble on whoever's going to be in government for their means to survive. I don't think that's a sustainable system, and it won't be sustainable in the upcoming years when less and less young people will be able to pay for pensioners. Yeah, so Jess, how would you actually argue then that your state pension should be funded? How do you actually think moving forward we can get to a situation where there is there is more fairness and equality within the system? I think individual responsibility and private pensions need to be encouraged further. I don't blame, again, I don't blame pensioners for going through this. They think it's OK for the state. You know, they believe in the state and that's one of the main issues. You know, the state isn't the most reliable system. And I think the individual, if you know there's um, a pot, which you can get at the end of your life, which you know when you've built up, I think that's the very best system. And there should be support for vulnerable people, vulnerable old people. And we need to explore that. But just having this system where everyone gets it, it's not sustainable. OK, Monica, then, the, the, the point that you raised earlier about there being this pot that we all pay into, you know, the idea that there's national insurance contributions and all of these other things that are a protected pot for the individual. That's actually sold to us all. This idea has been sold to us all, but it's not actually the case. It's not actually true. Is that the problem, that there's, there's just a general pot of taxation and not one isolated one for the individual themselves? You know, I think that's why I distinguish the line between benefits and a state pension, because I think a lot of people like to put those ideas into one pot and call it the same kettle of fish, and it's not. Um, I personally am a big advocate of less state intervention in many areas of government spending. Um, for example, I don't favour the benefit system as a whole. I don't think it's acceptable that people all children when they can't even afford to feed themselves. Um, however, that's not the same thing when it comes to state pensions, and as I said, these people have worked incredibly hard, or even if they haven't worked incredibly hard, they've spent a lifetime, they've gone through a lot more than a young 20-something person has, who has no real life experience, has not had to see the world yet. Um, so again, for me, it's just a sort of mindset of self-indulgence where you're putting your needs above those who raised you and gave you the priorities and the opportunities that you have today. And I think it's young people taking that for granted. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of my viewers will be saying, well, actually, I worked damn hard to buy my house, thank you very much, when mm -hmm. interest rates were a lot higher than they are today. But we'll have to leave it there, folks. That was the host and director of Reasoned, Jess Gill, and the political commentator, Monica. And then, Monica, I will get your name right. Uj Karl Nita, <laughs> is that right? Yes. That's perfect. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> I do apologise. Now, joining me in the studio is Victoria Houston, Head of Regulatory Affairs at the IEA. Where do you stand on all of that, that conversation? Do you think there... Can you see merits to both arguments that actually not every pensioner in the country is living on the land of milk and honey? And at the same time, a lot of young people can't afford to get on the house and ladder and won't have the same opportunities. Well, first of all, I think it's very important that you did um, correct what Monica said there about pensions not being a benefit. They are a benefit. They're paid out of current tax revenues. Mm -hmm. There is no pot. There is no separate hypothecated national insurance fund that's paying these pensions. We, as current taxpayers, are paying these pensions. And in a, in a way, though, the, the, the triple lock, um, which basically gives pensioners a guaranteed increase depending on the cost of living, um, and 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 the, the other factors. Now that's in a way quite sensible because pensioners often are on a fixed income, and it makes sense to de-risk them mm -hmm. because they often don't have the ability to take other measures to protect themselves, to pursue uh, other ways of of making money, and so on. And the idea is that we, as as thrusting healthy young taxpayers, can uh, look after ourselves more. But the problem is. Is, is when actually the economy is not working that way and that ability 
for us to work more hours or get promoted or move to a better job and earn more money. That's not working as it should because we are paying ever higher tax rates mm -hmm. ourselves on our own income. Moving house to, to, to a more affluent area to get a better job is ever more difficult because of, because of housing and planning. And all kinds of other things are introduced like occupational licensing, all of these factors that make it ever more difficult for younger people to look after themselves. So that is an, an unfairness. It's de-risking the pensioners, which is arguably not a bad idea, but without unleashing the ability of younger people to work harder and more productively to, to provide for ourselves. But you know, if I think to, to my grandparents, if I think to, to your own background, Victoria, a lot of people will be watching this and saying, hang on a minute, right? This idea that all pensioners are well off just simply isn't true, right? This caricature of the wealthy pensioner that benefits from the triple lock. Absolutely. And, you know, to give an example of my own parents who are facing their gas bill trebling yes. this winter, um, it's going to be very, very difficult for them indeed, as is going to be the case for many thousands of pensioners, but also going to be the case for many thousands, millions indeed, of um, people who are not yet of, of pensionable age. Now, there's a long-term argument about whether we should be means-testing pensions and all of the other associated benefits like bus passes mm -hmm. and winter fuel allowances, because as you alluded to, for a, lot of, for a lot of older people, that is just a, an annual bonus that's an, a nice to have. And the argument against the means testing, of course, is that that in itself introduces cost and complexity and you almost don't end up saving very much by the time you've put all of the administrative processes in to try and figure out who's entitled to it and who's not. And then inevitably... But it would solve cases. that inequality argument, wouldn't it? If people were getting things means tested, so you were getting it if you actually, you know, were... Well, I would actually really like to see some proper analysis done on what the costs and benefits would be yeah. of means testing pensions and associated old age benefits, because it could well be that the civil service just don't fancy the extra work involved, but, but maybe it would be quite a sensible thing to do. But again, I feel like the savings there are going to be quite ancillary compared to the costs that pensioners and indeed all of us are facing on, for example, our uh, energy bill. Absolutely, Victoria, absolutely. Marginal. Thank you very much. Victoria Houston, we'll come back to you. Now, folks, it's time for Grime Watch, a time to look at what you at home have been saying about the biggest stories of the week. We spoke earlier in the show about how we should control our borders, and a lot of you responded, so let's see what you had to say. Joe says, the first priority of any government should be the protection of its people. What happened? Alan replied, are they migrants or asylum seekers? Because there is a difference. Yes, and Alan, I do think... There is merit to that argument, right, in saying that actually people who are in France, safe in a country like France, are not those seeking to escape a war-torn country. David said, there's no screening for age or, or origination, health, security or anything. I don't know what the border force is for. Well, at the moment, it seems to be a ferry service. Brian remarked, what amazes me more is that no politicians or mainstream journalists are even mentioning it. Well, I beg your pardon, Brian. I think you'll find we cover it on this channel quite a lot. I wonder if they will once it starts to affect them or their families. Hmm. Jackie replied, if the Home Office got on with the job of processing asylum seekers properly, instead of assuming that they're all a threat, we'd have extra people available to fill vacancies and we'd free up resources to deal with the dangerous ones. Well, that's one argument, Jackie. Now, Derek says, why isn't this done as soon as they get off the boats? Well, I, I, Derek, I, the, Mark White, our home affairs correspondent here at the channel, he's actually told us of, of migrants who've gone missing from these hotels, who haven't had their fingerprints taken, who haven't had their photographs taken. And actually, I think there's a conversation to be had there about the national security implications. Carol jokes, do we still have an immigration department? Well, I'm not sure Carol was joking there because I think she's actually got a point. I'm not sure we do have border controls in this country. Now, folks, that's all we've got time for on Grind Watch, but your views are much more important than my own, so please do continue putting them in. Finally, folks, it was another successful week for England women's football, 
after they beat Spain 2-1 to make it through to the semi-finals of Euro 2022, where they'll face Sweden. A winning goal in extra time from Georgia Stanway ensured that the Lionesses still have a strong chance of winning their home tournament. So could they actually do it and show the men how it's done? Well, to discuss this, I'm thrilled to welcome back former football referee Janie Frampton. Janie, thank you for your time. As I understand it, Spain were one of the hot favourites to win Euro 2022. So how impressed should we actually be by the Lionesses' victory on Wednesday? Good after Darren. Lovely to be back. Um, when we first spoke after the game against Austria, we did say that the Lionesses were starting quite slow, even though we picked the points up, and we thought they'd go from strength to strength as the tournament went on. When they came up against Spain, um, I thought for a big part of the game to start with, Spain were by far the better team and went 1-0 up. But you've got to give it to the girls. In front of a 29,000 crowd at Brighton, they really dug deep. Their grit and determination was astounding. And they got the equaliser and then, of course, an extra time, Georgia's fantastic goal. And they're just showing what they're made of, Darren. Mm. Well, yeah, do you reckon that actually there could be a bit of a, you know, the girls saying to the boys, how are you, pet? Look how it's done. Oh, of course. You know, when I look at the rankings, and you're right, you know, Spain were higher than um, England in the rankings, as are France and Germany. So we are right up there amongst the best in the world, and we're holding our own without doubt. Sweden are second in the FIFA rankings, so it'll be very interesting to see how that game goes next week. Yeah. Now, you're in Birmingham right now, Ginny. I wonder how much does the, the hall of the of England actually have representation within the team. It's quite a diverse mix of, of, of places and, and people where people are from and accents, I dare say, as well. Yes, I think it's really interesting because going back to the days of old, Darren, you'd get, you know, most of the players either came from, you know, Arsenal or Chelsea or Man City. And it's really good to see now that the scouting system is working because we are getting quite a mix across the board mm -hmm. from different teams of girls representing us and the Lionesses. So do you think England can actually go on to win this? I do. Oh, well, so there we look are. Now, there's um, Sweden, England, France, Germany. They are all really strong teams. You never know, Darren, we could end up with an England-Germany final. Well, that would be something. And that actually would really put women's football on the map. Yeah, do you know, Darren, there was over 9 million viewers wow. watching that game against Spain. Who yeah, would have yeah, felt yeah. it? Incredible. That is incredible. And, Janie, I dare say that you are delighted about that fact. And actually, it's about time that the Lasses game got the same kind of focus as the male one. But, Janie Frampton, we're going to have to leave it there. My sincere thanks to you, as ever. I love having you on the show. That was the former <laughs> football referee, Janie Frampton, there. Now, folks, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I thank you very much for your company. The show's on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 o'clock. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking very wet and thundery in the northwest, warm sunshine in the southeast. Let's take a look at the details. Starting off in the southwest, and here it will be often cloudy with some rain at times, as well as blustery winds. The rain shouldn't be particularly heavy though. Meanwhile, in the southeast, and after a hot day, it will stay fine and very warm through the evening, with some further sunshine for most. A cloudier picture across Wales. Here there will be some blustery winds, especially around the coasts and over the mountains, with some spells of rain. It will also be largely cloudy around Birmingham and in the West Midlands, whilst it will be drier and less windy than further west. A few spots of rain are possible this evening. It's looking similar around northeast England, where there'll be quite a bit of cloud this evening and some outbreaks of rain, which could be heavy at times, with blustery winds too. A wet end to the day across Scotland with heavy and thundery spells of rain. A warning has been issued for southwestern Scotland where impacts are likely from the rain. There will also be some impacts from the rain for Northern Ireland, although the worst of this should have cleared here by this evening, albeit with some showers following. 
a little rain spreads across the UK overnight, whilst in Scotland the rain will continue to be heavy and thundery at times. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Hello, good afternoon and welcome. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of those big topics that are hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today, it's Associate Editor of the Daily Mail, Andrew Pearce, and also broadcaster and journalist, Danny Kelly. Before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thank you. Good afternoon. It's four o'clock. I'm Olivia Guthrie in the GB Newsroom. Disruption at the Port of Dover has largely eased after two days of delays, but attention has now moved to Folkestone and the Eurotunnel, where drivers are continuing to face problems. Delays in Dover have been reduced to around an hour after some drivers reported waiting up to 18 yesterday. However, now the AA has called Folkestone the new hotspot of holiday hell, warning, warning travellers were waiting several hours to get to the Eurotunnel terminal. The Highways Agency has warned of severe delays in Kent for people heading to either terminal. Additional checks on the border post-Brexit and understaffing of French officials has been blamed for the delays. But travel editor Simon Calder says the reality is quite different. Well, some of the ideas that this is all the French and they could just wave us through, that is absolutely not the case. Um, and it's quite interesting that, um, well, the government will be delighted with this headline from the front page of the Sunday Times, a French insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos. British insistence on passport stamp causing holiday chaos is actually the reality. The Board of Cricket Scotland has resigned ahead of the publication of an independent review into racism. The review has been conducted after Scotland's all-time leading wicket-taker Majid Hack told Sky Sports News Cricket Scotland was institutionally racist. In a letter, the board apologised and said the review would provide a watershed moment for Scottish sport. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have vowed to toughen controls on migration.